All right, we're back now with Bob on uh, our second session and DG Talk. I want to talk to you now and have you share with us, Bob. Um, obviously, when God does a revival in a location, mm -hmm. it has a tendency to kind of then spread to other places. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily just for that location alone, but God is doing something in the eternal now. Right. So tell me what you experience and what you guys learn, what was happening inside of people and how that would translate into his eternal plan for the church. Right, well, so in the immediate context of the revival at the time, that was Dr. Michael Brown's burden, that there was some kind of mechanism to train the people that were getting transformed, deeply Very touched, good. deeply yeah. refreshed, mm -hmm. you know, many of them born again at the revival. What do we do to disciple them and then send them? That was his immediate concern. So that's, you know, that's why they raised up the school. And that's why I wound up there was to teach at that school. And to this day, there are missionaries on the field that came out of that environment, out of that revival in our school. And um, uh, in, I think, I don't know, 20 some nations, 160 missionaries are out there. So that was one of the ways that the fruit of it was to be proven and born. Because the people are transformed, they're trained in their scent. Yes. You know, there was a lot that happened to people in that church and who visited, obviously, people getting refreshed. Uh, it impacted the community, which a historic revival should do. Yes. You know, God would visit the hallways of schools. And, wow. You know, teachers are getting transformed. Certain, you know, things were changed even in the way that people did their administrative duties and policies in, in different uh, arenas of life at schools mm. or wherever, you know. Um, when the revival would go on break, uh, the hotel or the local restaurant would call and say, is, is something wrong? <laughs> because they were getting an influx of people, giving them business. So, the, you know, the entire city pretty much knew about it. And, you know, there was both criticism and praise. But in terms of what God was doing, that missions movement was one of the immediate things, discipleship to missions. From a biblical uh, theological point of view, in, in my thinking, we always have to keep in mind the eternal purpose of God, Amen. which ultimately is, you know, all things being subbed up in Christ, yeah. where Jesus rules everything, even, you know, on that day, he comes and sets up geopolitically, not just spiritually, mm -hmm. his rule, you know, in the renewal of all creation, heaven on earth, you know, your kingdom come, your will be done, which is a reference to the eternal plan, right. on earth as it is in heaven. Like the term you use to come and kingdomize. Yes, people. right. Yes. And so when that happens to the entire creation, that's the eternal purpose where yes. Jesus is the ruler and center of yes. all that. Yeah. Before his return, the eternal purpose looks like people yes. who look like Jesus. Amen. Amen. So it's the, it's the revolution of a human being individually who's conformed to the image of God's son, right? That's Colossians 1, it's Romans 8 and elsewhere. This is the predestination of, of God. It's his predetermined plan for right. us that we be conformed to the image of his son. Yes. That's yes. his plan. Yes. Okay, it's not just historic visitation. Right. That's, that's one of God's ways to move us in his plan. But okay. ultimately his plan, in the name and in the image of his son, who is the word become flesh, is to have people yes. whose characters have been transformed and are being progressively transformed into that same image. That's the plan. Yes. And in Ephesians 4, that plan is articulated as applying to a corporate entity, the church. Yes. Right. So it's not just the individual disciples. But right. That is part of it. Yes. But it's to combine as a family, whether on the city level or in the smaller level of churches that constitute the city church, God's purpose for the church is corporately to look like Jesus. That's Amen. clearly yes. uh, given to us as God's purpose in Ephesians 4, really all throughout Ephesians. So my contention in the book is that any revival, in particular the revival that we experienced, because I was writing with those folks in mind, yes. but also writing for anyone who's had any experience of refreshing of God's manifest presence. Yes. Yes. All of this contributes to the hard work of discipleship and the hard work of church planting, yeah. which is to have Jesus people yes. on the earth, people who look like him from the inside out. Which you mentioned in your book is it takes massive time mm -hmm. to to really invest in seeing that come about. That right. We're not just 
trying to build an audience. Mm -hmm. We're trying to see people transformed into the image of Jesus. Right, yeah. amen. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I had in mind people that had experienced revival. Mm -hmm. And there was something wonderful, obviously, about God's manifest presence that in a sense did a lot of the work for us. I mean, God's just there piercing yeah. hearts. And yeah. There's such joy and such buoyancy mm -hmm. among the people. Mm -hmm. But none of that replaces the clear stewardship that right. we're given for discipleship yes. or the vision of the New Testament right. with its explicit instructions yes. regarding the nature of a New Testament church. Yes. So that means we're supposed to take that great wind in our sails mm -hmm. and invest it into the biblical vision and teaching yes. rather than assume, well, this is what life is all about. Just just the moments of revival. So, yes. so that's my great urgency and burden and that really is the central point of that book. Yes, so let's say today where people are looking for that next wave. Now I got saved in the era of the Jesus mm -hmm. people revolution and we were called Jesus people mm -hmm. back then. And, uh, the, and it was significant revival. It's partly the kind of revival that's happening at Brownsville but even more largely a revival of an awakening in this nation of our my generation into coming into the kingdom of God and getting saved. But again, as in that place, they were missing the element of discipleship. And so a lot of those that got saved in my generation um, backslid, they weren't brought into that transformational sanctification process. And so how do you see um, if there is another wave, an, an, another revival coming, you see that something that's going to be even better and, and different. How, how do you see Yeah, that? well, I mean, I would love to see oh, yes. a great outpouring of the Spirit right. poured out into the wineskin of apostolic wisdom, discipleship, yes. and church planting, Yes, which is what I mean by apostolic wisdom. Yes. But just like Jesus had a discipleship movement. Yeah, he did. Before Pentecost, mm -hmm. obviously he was God present with them. Right. And he said in his prayer in John 17, I was keeping them when I was with them. Now I'm going, mm -hmm. Father, you keep them. And then mm -hmm. the Spirit was poured out. Yes. But there was a, disciple, a discipleship movement waiting for the outpouring of the Spirit. Yes. And Jesus invested his time, his energy, obviously a, a huge part of his ministry on earth was making disciples. Mm -hmm. And you know, then he died to offer the sacrifice for anyone to come. But before that happened, he gave himself fully to a discipleship movement so that there was a wineskin waiting for the new wine. Yes. I say, I like that. Let's keep repeating that pattern. Let's yes. do our best yes. to get a hold of biblical wisdom for disciple making and church planting. Yes. So that in that next wave, yes. it comes into something that's properly prepared rather than just assuming that the outpouring is going to fix everything. Right. Because it doesn't. It doesn't. It's like I said yes. in the last segment. When God moves by his spirit, whether historically or just personally, he's assuming we're reading our Bibles. Yeah. He's assuming we're trying to be biblical Christians. Mm -hmm. So let's be ready for the next wave, whatever it is, so that we have a discipleship movement that's also church planting, creating family. Yes. yes. And character transformation, yes. relationships, and word ministry mm -hmm. so that when something extraordinary happens, we can keep it. Yes. Rather than have it destroy our wineskin and spill out. Yes. You know, Bob, he is, you are talking, you are, you're a voice to my heart because this is my passion, this is my burden, or this is our burden for a discipleship group. And uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to have Bob share his heart and his passion. And again, this book is right down the line of, of what we believe, what we represent, and which is why having having God speaking to another man that I highly respect and highly regard, this is so significant. So in the next segment, we want to focus a little bit more now on how he sees discipleship and perhaps how um, God may more or less navigate that into the next generation uh, coming up.